people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was on a three-day visit to India this week. The two sides discussed the entire gamut of ties and committed to not just strengthen but also expand the fields of engagement between the both. Observers say that it is going to be the most pertinent year for the two sides as the top leadership is going to meet for three times this year alone. The meetings will hold more significance for they are slated at a time when the world is staring at more divisions and conflicts than peace and dialogues. Delhi and Canberra now are part of a broader geopolitical identity, Indo-Pacific, who also contribute half the size of what has been deemed as a security grouping Quad, have committed to further strengthening their gamut of ties. Historically, the engagements between the two sides have been restricted to trade, but now they have also agreed to expand the horizon of their engagements as PM Anthony Albanese announced that Australia's Deakin University will now have a branch in India's under construction gift city in Gandhinagar. It does uh, give me enormous pleasure to acknowledge that Deakin University will be the first overseas university approved to establish a branch campus in India ever. Quite an achievement. It is the most comprehensive and ambitious arrangement agreed to by India with any country. It paves the way for commercial opportunities for Australian education providers to offer innovative and more accessible education to Indian students. And it provides a solid basis for our tertiary institutions to consider new ways of partnering with each other. The two sides are seemingly heading towards attaining the much-required momentum, having nearly carved out the entire framework of Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, or ECTA, to allow a barrier-free access to almost every section of each other's market. The ECTA will allow two sides to almost double the trade figures between the two sides in next five years. The bilateral trade between the two sides stood at 27.5 billion USD in 2021. As per different projections with ECTA in force, there is potential for trade to reach around 50 billion USD in five years. Prime Minister Albanese also visited Indian aircraft carrier INS Vikrant. The two sides, he said, were committed to deepening their defence ties in Indo-Pacific and beyond. For Australia, India is a top-tier security partner. The Indian Ocean is central to both countries' security and our prosperity. And there has never been a point in both of our countries' histories where we've had such a strong strategic alignment which has been reinforced by my current visit to India and will be reinforced further by Prime Minister Modi's attendance at the Quad Leaders meeting in a short period of time. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, while highlighting the two sides' camaraderie, said that both the sides were working over time to draft mechanisms that are both effective and productive to both the sides. Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Albanese are likely to meet on at least two more occasions this year on the sidelines of the Quad Summit and the G20 Summit scheduled to be held in New Delhi in September this year. प्रधान मंत्री एल्बेनी जी और मैं इस बात पर सहमत है कि हमारे द्विपक्षीय संबंध वैश्विक समुदायों वैश्विक चुनौतियों से निपटने के लिए और वैश्विक कल्याण के लिए महत्वपूर्ण है मैंने प्रधानमंत्री एल्बेनी जी को 
भारत की जी ट्वेंटी अध्यक्षता की प्राथमिकताओं के बारे में बताया और ऑस्ट्रेलिया के सतत सहयोग के लिए उनका आभार भी व्यक्त किया Observers believe that this year could prove to be the most crucial year to the Indo-Australia bilateral ties. While the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's visit was primarily focused at deepening the bilateral cooperation between the two sides, the observers see it in the line of efforts being made to strengthen the quadrilateral alliance of the United States, India, Japan and Australia. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is set to visit India later this month. Although the Quad countries haven't explicitly declared the grouping's agenda, observers are increasingly putting their weight behind the group, countering the future Chinese games in the Indo-Pacific. New Delhi, however, in line with its pro-people agenda, is more focused on deals that can ensure its people both security and prosperity. Moving on. Deadly attacks, abject poverty, unprecedented inflation and shrinking forex reserves. The list of problems in Pakistan rages on and on. The International Monetary Fund's reluctance in providing Pakistan bailout relief has further twisted the knife in its wounds. And with opposing political sides becoming increasingly hostile and accusatory instead of joining hands in times of crisis, even the flimsy prospects of the country's recovery have dried out. Is the end near for Pakistan or will Pakistan be able to miraculously emerge from the crisis? Join us as we try to find answers to all these questions. Rarely has the IMF appeared as hesitant as it is in the case of Pakistan, where even months of negotiations have yet to persuade the global lender to release over a billion dollars to the struggling nation. Pakistan has been desperately trying to obtain the 1.1 billion final tranche of the 6.5 billion USD bailout program finalized with the IMF in 2019. The IMF has time and time again refused to release the funds, for Pakistan has no sustainable economic structure in place to pay back the loans. After advice from the IMF, including from its chief, Kristalina Georgieva, asking the Pakistan government to heavily tax the country's rich. Pakistan presented the finance bill last week to shore up its revenues by around 650 million USD, approximately 170 billion Pakistani rupees. The IMF has warned the country that it must take tough measures over a sustained period in order to prevent itself from plunging into a point of no return. Many say that Pakistan is unlikely to collect as much revenue as is the current goal. Even if the country succeeds in raising 650 million USD, is there any plan of action that can put Pakistan on a correction course? With its citizens fighting for daily survival, Pakistan is deeply indebted. The country's total external debt amounted to 126.3 billion USD at the end of 2022. This is even more worrisome when the inflation rate in Pakistan is already hovering at around 30%. As per a World Bank estimation, the debt service on all external debt in 2023 will be 26.4 billion USD. What do you have left now? There's absolutely nothing. So even the money that is going to come, it is previously sanctioned money, if it comes at all. It is previously sanctioned money and it is only going to last you till about uh, April or May. As if the country's economic uncertainty wasn't enough, the Pakistani political landscape is becoming increasingly unstable by the day. Shabazz Sharif's government and the former Prime Minister Imran Khan have been mudslinging each other. Both sides have traded blows and have accused each other of incompetence. Khan, despite being ousted as Prime Minister, enjoys huge popular support and has by and large succeeded in disrupting the daily functioning of the government. On the other side, Sharif and his coterie have increased pressure on Khan and have charged him with several strict violations. This has led to a widening of the rift between the two side supporters. Some experts have cautioned that a deteriorating political landscape 
coupled with widespread poverty, could trigger a civil war in the state. Pakistan, remember, is a highly militarized society. It is an extremely violent society. I mean, you see even at the best of times how violent they are. You have mobs that go around burning people for blasphemy. You have uh, terrorist attacks all over the place. The crumbling political and economic foundations of Pakistan have paved the way for terrorism in the country to rear its ugly head. The series of events has particularly emboldened the TTP, the Tehriki Taliban Pakistan. Rival factions in Islamabad have blamed each other for the TTP's resurgence. The TTP has not only wreaked havoc across Pakistan, targeting both civilians and security forces alike, but has also staked a claim on forming government. As per various news reports, the TTP has already announced a parallel, full-fledged cabinet. The TTP poses an imminent threat as Pakistan, already severely economically weakened, is in no position to wage war against terrorism in the country. With multiple crises plaguing Pakistan's common people, one can only hope that relief will come from any front possible. Moving on. What is needed in our current global climate, rife with crisis and polarization? Who should countries who are grappling with social, political or economic hurdles look to for help and support? The answer, a leader. Another question that arises is who, given the volatile nature of the current global geopolitical state, checks all the boxes that is required of a leader? Some of the most influential people around the world have all pointed in one direction, India the living embodiment of all the virtues that characterize a leader. Join us today as we make the case that India is the only country in the world that can bridge the divide in this increasingly hostile world. The United Nations, with unanimous Indo-Pacific support, appointed India as the non-permanent member to the UN Security Council for the eighth time in 2021. This is an honor, no doubt. However, why was India, the second most populous country with increasingly bright economic prospects, not on the permanent UNSC table? Why has a select group denied and is continuing to deny India her fair share of representation? The course that followed India's appointment has been even more significant. India, adhering to her pro-people, pro-world stance, highlighted and pursued issues that previous UNSC compositions had largely remained insensitive to. From a standalone comprehensive discussion on maritime security, to a resolution on war-torn Taliban-ruled Afghanistan, to food security and human rights of all those who have been rendered dispossessed in Syria and Yemen, India has ensured that the world discussed and deliberated on what matters the most. India was, uh, as always, world's pharmacist. Uh, I have uh, found that India reached not only to the neighborhood, but also as far as uh, Latin America and, and the Caribbean and the Pacific. Unless provoked, India, despite having one of the largest and most powerful set of armed forces, has never flexed its military muscles. India's smaller neighbors have all benefited from India's friendly outreach gestures. India has, on many occasions, come to the rescue of its economically dwindling neighbors. Sri Lanka, which has been affected by its worst economic crisis in seven decades, was supported with over 3.8 billion USD of packages, including credit lines, deferred import payments, and currency swaps between the period of January of 2022 and July of 2022 alone. India came to Sri Lanka's rescue when it was going through its worst economic phase ever. India also recently set aside 24.5 million USD for war-torn Afghanistan. As per the government statement provided in Lok Sabha, the lower house of Indian parliament. As many as 37 lines of credit 
worth 14.27 billion USD, have been provided to five of India's neighboring nations. The progress of India in these last years has been remarkable and extraordinary. And I think the position of India now, this is again my view as an outsider, is potentially more powerful than it's ever been. At a time when she attained the momentum needed for her rapid industrialization, India also agreed to net zero, a global campaign for minimizing carbon emissions until zero for the greater interests of the global good. Many of the world's greatest economies industrialize with no such commitment to environmental protection goals. India has proven that it will not cave in to foreign pressure, especially Western pressure. India, while always maintaining a people-first policy, has shown that it will draw lines when they need to be drawn. No amount of prime time or op-ed pressure could force India into altering her position on the Russia-Ukraine war. In fact, both the warring sides, on different occasions, have urged the global community to incorporate an Indian presence at the highest level of decision-making. We uh, see the prospect of making the Security Council more democratic exclusively, exclusively through broadening the representation of the countries from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We note um, India and Brazil in particular as key international actors and worthy candidates for permanent membership within the Council. This is an imbalance when Africa, Latin America, most of Asia, Central and Eastern Europe comply with the right of veto that they themselves never had. And this is what Ukraine is talking about. And have you ever heard such words from Russia? But it's a permanent member of the Security Council. For some reason. For what reason? No Japan or Brazil, no Turkey or India, no Germany or Ukraine. The day will come when this will be resolved. India's insistence on purchasing Russian oil, despite much international pressure for sanctions, needs to be looked at more broadly, as India's decision was based on protecting the economic well-being of one-sixth of the global population. Indian trade, economics, and investment policies have been hailed across the world for their transparent transactions. India has consistently floated the idea of reformed multilateralism, and has also continually urged the world to be respectful to the territorial sovereignty of all. While China and the United States have been accused by many countries for predatory, expansionist, and intrusive foreign policy, Indian foreign policy has been pro-people and pro-dialogue. Indian actions have reinforced her position of working for peace and people, not for divisions and war. From international solar alliance in line with global endeavors to counter climate change, to Yoga Day, a campaign to promote a healthy lifestyle, Indian propositions have direct, concrete benefits for humanity. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Over 600 soldiers from U.S., Thai and other militaries participated in a live ammunition fire exercise this week to conclude the region's largest annual joint military drill known as Cobra Gold. The combined arms live fire exercise was joined by soldiers from the U.S., Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia involving air and ground operations as well as artillery assaults. Cobra Gold is one of the world's longest-running multilateral military exercises and the biggest in Southeast Asia, serving as a key platform for Washington to shore up alliances in Asia at a time of increasing competition with China. In total, this year's full-scale exercise involved over 7,000 personnel from 30 countries. The Washoku World Championship was recently held in Tokyo. This was the 10th edition of the event, 
which aims to take Japanese cuisine to new heights. A total of 139 chefs applied for the competition, of which six cleared the preliminary rounds and progressed towards the finals. The theme of this year's competition was dashi, which literally translates to broth. Dashi or broth is an important component to enhance the flavor of Japanese dishes. For the final competition, contestants have prepared five serving appetizers that are to be cooked using traditional Japanese 8 inch plates. The cooking time is 120 minutes. The judges examine the taste of dashi along with the presentation of the dishes. The winner is Jakub Horak from Czech Republic. The appetizer he cooked was highly praised for its balance, time distribution for cooking and the idea to use Czech ingredients. After returning to their homelands, these chefs will introduce Washoku to their homelands, which will help spread the glory of Japanese cuisine. Japanese global motorbike giant Yamaha Motors is trying to be inclusive in its employment procedures. 90% of Yamaha's annual sales come from foreign countries. Yamaha tries to hire employees from different nations and genders in its firm. Yamaha Motor Mirai is the name of entire company. The word Mirai means future. Yamaha also aims to employ the especially abled and thus help in creating a better society. ヤマハモーターミライはですね、え、ま、ヤマハ発動機の特例子会社っていうことで、え、2015年に設立された会社です。え、みんなの未来を、え、一緒に作っていこう。障害者も健常者も関係ないっていうことで、で、今回理念を
Holi, a kaleidoscopic culture, is exciting for adults as well as kids. Underneath the dancing and colourful kiosk lies unique culture and deeply rooted tradition. In Mathura district of India's northern state of Uttar Pradesh, Holi is celebrated to mark the eternal love between Lord Krishna and Radha. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.